We're over in the beautiful setting of Barclay Castle in Gloucester. A lot of military vehicles here this weekend, collections from the Military Vehicle Trust. Amongst those vehicles are some very rare and valuable military vehicles. Well, they all are valuable to a degree, but some of them rarities, some you don't see very often, and those are the vehicles we're concentrating on today. Well, we're going to start our collection today with something very interesting and reasonably rare. It's the Volvo staff car, of course, from Sweden. Ideal vehicle for the collector who uh, wants to ride around to the various shows in comfort because, as you can see, the bodywork itself is a, a Volvo saloon car of the 50s. It's got four-wheel drive and a very reliable, solid six-cylinder side valve engine. These are getting quite uh, valuable nowadays because of their um, easy to keep and easy to maintain and of course the pleasure in driving them around which is somewhat different than some of the bigger vehicles that we see on the rally fields. These vehicles too were <laughs> fitted with a terrific heating system being from the Scandinavian area which um, could well be suited to the British summer. There she is inside very much the standard Volvo car interior except for the four-wheel drive and the reduction gear selection levers. An unusual sight isn't it? Now a little bit more comfortable and a little older too is the Ford Mercury. I've known this car for many many years now and its driver and he has uh, used it home and abroad on many military vehicle rallies and uh, events. It's the Ford Mercury American staff car. Many of these were used by the American Army for taking their um, high-ranking officers around in comfort and at speed too because they were fitted with either a V8 engine or some of them were fitted with the six-cylinder engine. But she's a beautiful car, a beautiful ride and uh, certainly a rather classy sight among the more rugged military vehicles that we see. Nothing uh, military about it as far as the uh, special editions are concerned because it's purely and simply a, a Ford Mercury car uh, brought into the uh, service for use by the uh, generals who didn't want to ride around in a jeep. Not so comfortable. <laughs> We've got the little tank here that's uh, built by the American Car and Foundry Company. A lot of these were supplied to the British and they were first used in Libya and I think it was 1941 when the British gave it the name of Honey. How the British come by that name I don't know, sounds a little bit more American to me but that's what history tells us. They were originally fitted with a um, Continental 7 cylinder and sometimes the uh, Grieberson 9 cylinder engine but later on they were uh, manufactured by Cadillacs and then they were built under the name as the M5. But a useful, nippy little light tank, the Honey. In fact, we've got two here. This is another version of the Honey. This is uh, a different turret arrangement on here with a much uh, lighter armour. But as you can see, very versatile, very swift. Brings a gleam to the eyes of the enthusiast. But just look at the equipment that these uh, enthusiasts collect and in some cases make to put on their tanks to bring them out about that authentic look. You really got a hand in full marks for the way they put these vehicles into an exhibition. 
Today we're going to have a little bit of a demonstration on the uh, power of the uh, tank recovery lorry in pulling two of these little honeys around the field at Barclay Castle. Looks like he's got his fuel for the tank and his rations for himself and a typical old sight during the wartime, the American canvas bucket. I've seen them full of beer on occasions, believe me. How's that for 100% equipment, eh? And I can assure you the gun's been deactivated. The old Yankee bed roll. And invariably the Americans would put a name on their tank. I remember when we had a, a tank regiment near us back in 43, 44, I used to know all the tank names off by heart Cracker Jack, Popeye, etc., etc. There she is, that's the War of France. It's a 6x6, the Model M1. They were originally fitted with a big 145 horsepower Continental petrol engine, but most of them now due to economy and the old petrol engines have been worn out are fitted with a, a more up-to-date diesel engine because to, to run a thing like that on two or three miles per gallon is uh, beyond most of the collector's uh, financial means. They made a few different models at Wardle de France with uh, some with one winch and some with two. There she is showing her pulling ability with two honey tanks. And with that power available and six wheel drive, should have found it quite easy. The World of France is quite a rare vehicle because most of the uh, American tank recovery vehicles we see over here are the uh, model 969 Diamond T, but uh, occasionally these World of France will crop up and it's always a pleasure to see them. They're so typical of the big American trucks, old bonnet and a small cab. Chappy standing on the running board, that's Jeff Brown, he's uh, a helper here at uh, Barclay and was once the owner of a big diamond tee and knows quite a bit about uh, heavy haulage and winging as Jeff. So he's keeping a watchful eye on this uh, little procession as it goes around the ring. Rather a nice name, Nightmare, isn't it? When it comes to working on them and maintaining them, well, it could be very appropriate. Well, here we are in unusual colours too, the Na US Navy colours, it's the Duck, the GMC D-U-K-W, hence the name Duck and of course it's an amphibious vehicle so the name is very fitting. These were based on the GMC 2.5 ton 6x6 chassis with the same engine, the big uh, 600 petrol engine overhead valve that were fitted to the uh, big jimmies and designed for troop landing and they had a lot of successful um, 
Ventures to their credit. There's no doubt about that. This is one of the later ones with a sloping windscreen. And now another example that uh, certainly established a good name, not only during World War II, but way and beyond, were used for many uh, fracas since the war, including that out in the Middle East. It's the International Half Track made by internationals and whites of America, almost identical to look at from the outside, but you can pick out the international here, there's no flanges on the side of the uh, front mud car. International's own engine in this model, and see the roller on the front, some of them had a winch on the front, that, would, um, that roller would enable you to, if you did go nose down in a ditch, it would sort of help you out the other side. This is British now, the ferret. In another of our series, we talked about the little uh, Daimler Dingo. Well, this is the follow-on, the post-war version of that Daimler Dingo. But instead of Daimler's engine now, we have the Rolls-Royce B-Series engine. But still a pre-selector gearbox. One in a different uh, suit here, different camouflage, with guards armoured division um, fist on there. It was at the 7th armoured. I'm not sure of that one. Somebody will put me right. But it's very interesting looking around these, look at all the equipment, plus the div signs, etc. Beautiful little vehicles, very versatile, and used as an armoured scout car. A ferret. One of the comical things I found about this is, one is trying to get into it at my age, another thing is the steering wheel is in there sort of upside down, but it's there for purpose. Now that's very rare, it's a one-off, and it's uh, an advert there. So don't be deceived and to think we've got uh, rare aircraft here as well, but it's a beautiful model, isn't it? When I first saw this motorbike, I thought it was a, a Triumph TRW, which is the 500 twin that they built for the Army post-war period. But instead of that, I found it's got a 350 overhead valve engine. So I approached the chap thinking that he'd made a few alterations, but he assured me, and uh, there's a new one on me, that this was produced for the Dutch Army, the 350 twin Triumph. Very interesting bike indeed, and certainly drew my attention. Very nice bike, that one. Sounded nice, too, because it's got the uh, Siamese port system, you know, the two exhausts going into one. This is unusual, isn't it? It's the Bedford OX. It's the little 30 underweight version of the three-tonner, but it's got German markings. Now, this little group set themselves up as one of the sort of SAS-type groups that went in behind the German lines with certain uh, convoys where they went in to uh, cause damage and havoc in North Africa. And apparently they did use similar vehicles to this. I wasn't aware of this campaign, but uh, the young lad in charge there, he could tell me all about it, that he'd read about it, so he thought he'd do up his vehicles a little differently. But the lorry itself, the famous British Bedford. They built these uh, old snub-nosed lorries, three-ton and 30 underweight versions, and were the loveliest vehicles to drive and of course came into civilian use with these old bonnets in tipper and flatbed form. Alongside it is the Jeep and note how the grill has been cut away. This is something that the long distance desert patrols used to do. They wanted to get as much air in around that engine to keep it as cold as possible. They had problems out there with those temperatures. Two spare wheels, fully equipped. Bags of fuel there too. Because when you're out there in the desert in wartime, there aren't many filling stations about. Yes, we forgive you for painting it. German colours if you fly the Union Jack. Now, not only have we got that rare setup, this is a, certainly a rare setup. It's based on the Israeli army. This is one of the very last um, Willys Jeeps produced, as used by the Israelis. The young lad driving that is quite an authority on uh, this particular um, 
set up and there is the um, scout car the um, let me look at the wheel it's another international half track yes followed by a dodge um, weapons carrier also done up in the israeli colors these vehicles would have been types used by the israeli army but uh, that is sort of a post-war period, as this is now, or the later Land Rover, that's not so rare, but there's all sorts of vehicles come around here. Some are um, this type of thing, the ambulance now, and is, is coming out of the services and being used for all sorts of um, uses, but when they do them up in the ambulance colours and bring them around to the military vehicle shows, they're quite handy because there's good accommodation and good sleeping accommodation in the back of them. That's the 101 series Land Rover with a V8 engine. It's the Army's Range Rover, really. Another little post-war vehicle here coming around. I'm not sure of the make of that one. Somebody will pick me up on that. But uh, then again, it's uh, another of our modern ones that's coming onto the scene now. And uh, at the moment, few and far between. But uh, we'll probably get more plentiful as the years go by. There we can see the white scout car, which is the same front as we saw with the half tracks earlier on. Now you can see the flanges on the side of the mudguard on that. It's built by White of America, and that would have a side valve engine, not built by White's, but by Hercules of America, who supplied lots of engines to other uh, manufacturers. That was used by the Americans as a scout car with the armoured divisions, but um, we used them in the British Army mainly as a utility in a general purpose vehicle. I know with uh, my old regiment, the artillery, we used it as um, an OP, that's the Observation Post Command Vehicle, where you could carry a few radios in the back, and there was more room to operate radios there than there was in the usual Jeep. But a very nippy vehicle they were indeed. Four-speed gearbox and two-speed axle with four-wheel drive and that too has a roller on the front for helping it get out of a ditch should it go nose down in and uh, of course they were used to a lot of cross-country work. I think it always looks quite racy despite its square lines it sits nice and a uh, very fast vehicle on the road. The Dodge Weapons Carrier. Well, it might be a little bit on the rare side now, but during the war over here, they were <laughs> many and plentiful. The Yanks used these as their general purpose runabout. It was the sort of next stage up to the Jeep. In fact, sometimes they did refer to them as the Peep. But that's not a name that's sort of followed on very much now. The Dodge Weapons Carrier. The good old Dodge side valve engine in there. Four-speed gearbox, two-speed axle. A nice tidy vehicle. Always seemed to be up together. They were certainly well built. Ah, now we're back in the British industry again now with the Leyland Martian. That's a beautiful lorry if ever there was one. That's Rolls-Royce powered. It's got a big eight-cylinder Rolls-Royce engine in there. Now, we've had the opportunity to drive one of these. And believe me, they're very simple to drive. You've got power steering, synchro mesh gearbox. They really are a sweet vehicle to drive, except you've got to sort of make plenty of room and allowances. And uh, well, quite a lot of vehicles on the road make allowances for you. But there she is. She's a huge artillery tractor of the post-war years. Coming onto the circuits... Uh, Quite a few of them now coming about, but to see one done up in that um, camouflage and in that condition, that's rare indeed. The Leyland Martian, a lovely lorry if ever there was one. Named Bertha, no doubt after the Big Bertha, one of the well-known guns used in World War One. Certainly some size vehicle, that. But I say, with a big eight-cylinder petrol engine, it's so smooth to drive. Driving it doesn't seem like a big lorry up there. Until you've got to get through somewhere 
a little bit narrow. Next on the scene is our little Austin Champ. I always love to see these turn up at a show. They're a clever little vehicle with a Rolls Royce petrol engine, four cylinder, a five speed gearbox with no reverse in the gearbox. You reverse the whole lot, so you've got five reverses as well. But uh, a charming little four by four vehicle. Now, this is rare. Built for the United States Air Force, as you can see on the side there, is an international tractor. Uh, looks like an ordinary farm tractor, but painted up differently. But as you can see on the board here, it is just that little bit different with the sprung axle, etc. And uh, capable 40 miles per hour in fifth gear. So it's a purpose built tractor for towing purposes on the airfields. A real rare one, that. It's an interesting part of this military vehicle collection. There's something for everybody, be it motorcycles, lorries, cars, and even tractors. Even the good old faithful Morris Thousand. Well, what's that doing there? It's apparently used by the um, tank regiment there as a staff car. You see the tank regiment badge over there on the right? Our beautiful little Morris Thousand designed by Alec Isagonis, the Morris Thousand Traveller, which was back in the 50s and 60s, the ideal family car, and of course the army found them ideal as well, on rare occasions. Beautiful restoration. Another Dodge, very similar chassis to the weapons carrier we saw in the Israeli colouring, but this is the Dodge Ambulance. Same old six-cylinder Dodge engine. They stuck to side valve engines for many, many years, but what reliable motors they were. Yeah, back in World War II, I'm sure many a injured squaddy would have been glad to see that sight. And here's another Dodge here, this time with saw a little pickup truck. Might get a better view of that later. Unlike our old Austin ambulances, these dodges were four wheel drive and had a much better chance to get to you. Now we're going to have a little interlude. <laughs> Not a rare military vehicle, but uh, a rare sight here at Bark de Castle. It's the local ATC with their little band. And uh, finding it rather difficult to keep in step on grass and uh, not an easy matter, I can assure you. But they did well, provided a bit of entertainment. Now this must be rare because it's the only one I've seen on the uh, military vehicle front. <laughs> so that is the restored military vehicle. It's built by Thornycroft of Basingstoke, that wonderful old classic vehicle builder, who now have uh, a very big uh, museum down there at Basingstoke. It's the Thornycroft the Big Ben. Thornycroft's own engine, and it was used for um, articulated work, as you see here in the services, for uh, container work heavy goods work, supplies, all sorts of things. Now, the people now use that big trailer as their um, accommodation whilst on the rally field, which gives them plenty of room. But she's a fine old stalwart, that, of the British classics, the Thornycroft Big Ben. <laughs> It's 
a very old British firm, not Thornycroft, right back to the turn of the century when they started up. Right now we got a very interesting vehicle here now, one I'm very happy to be with. It's the Daimler Dingle. A very advanced bit of technology, considering it was designed well before World War II by the Daimler Motor Company. And these were useful as a, a scout car. They've got a rear engine, and a very unusual transmission by Wilson, that's the Wilson gearbox, which had a pre-select gear change, more of that later. But this is done up in uh, desert camouflage with the famous Desert Rat division. The first model of these, the Mark I, actually had four-wheel steering, and then eventually they did away with that and uh, found them quite adequate with just the normal steering. But the unusual thing about the transmission is that it's got a five-speed pre-selector gearbox. There's no reverse in the actual gearbox. You've got your selection here, where you select your gear, and it'll only engage the gear when you operate the clutch. There's a lever over there that you operate that slides the whole transmission into reverse. So then you've got five reverses. And this is why the steering wheel is sort of at an angle. You can motor backwards at a, a fair rate of knots with these. It's a fascinating little vehicle. Here we've got the smoke canisters. Normally she'd be carrying a Bren gun for armament. In the back would be a, a 19 set radial set or a 22 set. This is the aerial mount. And here's the huge grill and grid at the back for taking the uh, six cylinder Daimler motor. Not very good on petrol, but they're a lovely little vehicle. They sound really nice. And uh, they served the British military for many, many years. And I remember serving in Palestine with these vehicles alongside us, not in our regiment, but the Lancers had them, with railway wheels, and they would travel in front of the trains that we were escorting on the lines to detect any bombs on the lines to save the train, which was a rather a suicide mission. But I've got a lot of affection for this old favourite of mine, the Daimler Dingo. Well, the um, Dingo can have a ride all the way to the uh, show on this trailer. It's a purpose-built trailer, but it was originally an uh, American uh, jerry can refueler. Now, next to that, in the same colour, is a DAF. Now, there's a young lad who... Now, your name is... Paul. Paul. Rob Paul. You're the expert on this DAF, I understand, uh, because I know very little about these, only what you've told me earlier. So, what? This goes back to the 1950s. 1952, it was first developed. Yes. The first one was brought out. For the Norwegian yeah. Army. The first one, though, had a problem with the front diffs in the front. Yeah. And the wheels actually fell off on them. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. So they redeveloped them. I think the you said one. earlier that it was developed for the Norwegian army, but financed by America. And yeah, the design went in by the Americans. The Americans designed it and then the Norwegians built it. And it had the American them. Hercules engine in there that you weren't too keen on and you replaced yeah, it yeah. for economy reasons too. Um, how many of them were built? I'm not sure exactly, but there were quite a few. And it was built as an artillery tractor to yeah. pull the British 25 pounder. Yeah, now, the first one was made as a cargo and it yeah. has panels that go in the floor in the back to make it a cargo deck. Yeah. And then for the 25 pounder they extended the back so you could turn sharper so you didn't catch on the back and then they towed the 25 pounder. And that would have the crew cab on the back for the 25 yeah. lads like our old quad used to. You got the artillery flash on there you see. Now you said earlier there's some very interesting little bits and pieces down here. One interesting point here We've got a spare wheel on either side, and of course, being slung low, when you're over rough ground, it could cause a lot of drag. Yeah. But the idea is it was built, although it was there as a spare, it will rotate and avoid that. There's a lot of interesting little features and in you this. You can also use it with your spare as well, so. Oh yes, of course that, yeah. yes. And uh, now, the handle here. This is for the ground anchor under there. The ground anchor for when it's winching. Yeah because it's got a very ingenious winching idea, hasn't yes, it? Yes. And uh, the winch you, you pointed out was, um, the rope was continually fixed to the hook yeah. so that you could uh, get the, the gun stuck at the back. You could unhitch the gun and still pay the rope out, pull it yeah. back in, it would automatically hitch back on again. Because of what it's like in the cab, you can do it all from the cab, you don't have to get out. Yeah, well, I remember with the old 25-pounders in my day, we all, all this had to be done manually. And yeah. the transmission. Fascinating stuff, is well, it's, it? It's got no axles in the middle. No. The only diff is in the middle. And the, the, and the shafts drive down along Comes either up, side, yeah. right down through here, through these universal couplings. You've got worm drive. And, and you've actually stuff. got a rocking beam yeah. principle here for a rough terrain, similar yeah. to the old Scammel Pioneer. Beautifully designed, and the ideas have come from so many different 
yeah. aspects that have been yeah. uh, learnt through World War Two, I'm sure. And they did actually make a track for them as well. Like the a track would go round like the our six wheelers would have in there. Paul, thank you very much for that useful bit of information on this daft vehicle. And um, how many have we got in this country now with these? Well, this is the only one we know of running in this is country. It? Yeah. I thought she was pretty rare, and this yeah. is all about rare military vehicles, and we certainly got one here. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. That's all right. Another little vehicle here, built by the Americans, by Studebaker, the Studebaker Weasel. Now, we've got Craig here, who owns and drives this little weasel, and who better to talk about it than himself. Why was the weasel built then, Craig? Well, it, originally it was designed to uh, uh, provide support for SAS type operations in, uh, in, in Norway. Um, the, the original um, concept was to attack the heavy water production facilities, uh, but by the time they designed and built the weasel, um, Adolf, in his wisdom, had decided the nuclear option wasn't for him. He spoiled a lot of things. <laughs> so then they, they uh, so at, at that point, they've got a very high mobility vehicle. And just to give you some idea of its um, footprint, um, I think a Jeep um, has a footprint, a total footprint area about of, a, uh, of about 177 square inches. A weasel puts down three and a half thousand square inches of footprint. Yeah, so it's ideal cross country. So it, it just doesn't sink in. No. Uh, now, the engine is Studebaker's own engine, the yeah. Champion. Is that a yeah. side valve engine? No, it is, six cylinder yeah. side valve. And what about the gearbox? Uh, it's basically a Jeep gearbox, three, so three speed, th three speed yeah. with, with a two speed reduction. Two, two speed transfer case. Yeah. Uh, but but the yes, it's it's essentially a, a Willis Jeep gearbox. Fair speed? Um, really, not much more than about 25 miles an hour, 20, right? 25 to 30. Well, she wasn't built for no. that anyway, especially no. going to no. Norway, what she was going to do. The, these things on the back are quite interesting because they, they were designed to, to have um, a line attached to them. So the two, uh, two um, lines of skiers could hook onto that and be towed across the snow on their skis with all their kit in the back. Um, Obviously, to, to, to speed up the we'll deployment. demonstration of that in the ring later. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks, Craig. That's very interesting. I haven't seen many weasels over the years. I used to know one down in the southern part of the country, but that's gone now. And it's lovely to see it here today. And rare military vehicles is what it's all about. Thank you, Craig. Okay. Talking of artillery, this was designed to, uh, well, follow on from the old uh, Morris Quad that we were using for artillery purposes. It's the low-line Albion artillery tractor. Now, this is a real beauty, and this is one that really took my eye and took my heart. I, I love this old lorry because you don't see them very often. There weren't very many built, and to have one now restored in this condition really is a rarity. Albion's own petrol engine in there, six-wheel drive, real beauty. But of course, the war ended and this particular vehicle didn't go into production. But she's pulling a rather big gun around on this occasion, but originally designed to pull the 25-pounder. And I'm sure it would have been capable of a, an even better cross-country performance than the old um, quads that we use. It's being six-wheel drive, and of course, those four back wheels could also be fitted with tracks. Here's the little um, auto union. Look at the Audi sign on the front. German. This is the Munga. German Jeep. Another of those little utility vehicles that uh, were used by every army. They found them so useful. That, of course, is a post-war vehicle. 
Not a rare vehicle, the Land Rover, but certainly it's a rare camouflage. I didn't find out where she was um, camouflaged for, but it's got to be uh, somewhere in icy conditions, I should imagine. The Land Rover, something that's crept into every corner of the services since World War II. Followed on, of course, from the idea of the Jeep, but uh, certainly went on to be more advanced um, technically. Until after the First World War. The Windsor Carrier, this was built in uh, Canada, a very rare piece this. Ford V8 engine, used by the Canadian and the British forces. Very similar to what we used to call the Brengon Carrier, but these are just a little bit longer with the uh, extra wheel on the side, for you enthusiasts who with the very astute observation. Steered by a steering wheel, not levers, but it actually warps the tracks to get it around the corners. The Windsor Carrier. Now, who's flying the uh, Stars and Stripes? Well, there they are. Get your dog tags printed. Some of these lads in this uh, game want to be very enthusiastic so they, and very uh, authentic too, and uh, they get their dog tags. That's the little name tags that hang around their neck for the you youngsters who don't know what dog tags are. We used to be able to do a similar thing as this on the old railway stations for a penny back just before the war. What happened to those old machines? And of course everything's supplied and available for the enthusiast. Well when you look around and see how authentic the setups are, well you know how busy these uh, little rally side shops are. Enough here to start your own little army. Here, advertising the Military Vehicle Trust, that's the club shop. The Military Vehicle Trust, or as we see here, the MVT, caters for vehicle owners, enthusiasts, so you don't even have to have a vehicle, you can join the Military Vehicle Trust, you'll get your regular magazine called the Windscreen, and become a member of a very enthusiastic group of people. Just sign in. Yeah, when they built old Barclay Castle, it suffered many an onslaught, but it never expected to see a range of vehicles such as this. There's another big American staff car, this time a Plymouth. Very similar in its use to the Ford Mercury we saw earlier. And quite likely a V8 engine too. But not 100% so, some of them were six cylinder. Nice authentic uniforms here. Sure Looks like um, husband and wife set up here with a common interest, which is nice, but um, I wish he'd shave his beard off. He'd be much bit more authentic then, wouldn't he? Don't tell him I said so. So, it's, uh, anyway, it's a nice day. Another of uh, the post-war, more recent, this is some of the later um, utility vehicles we're getting on the um, rally fields now. Some by Dodge and some by Chev. 
These were used quite a lot over here on the um, American airfields. Of course, now being um, sold off and coming in the hands of the lads of the Military Vehicle Trust. Not only vehicles, of course, they um, replicate some of the regiments of the American Army, especially because a lot of this is American enthusiasm because there's so much more equipment available to them, I think. These lads here are um, depicting, I think, one of the Vietnam uh, groups. But everywhere it crops up, doesn't it? The good old Jeep. Well stacked up for combat there. He got a smile on his face because he knows darn well he's not going to be shot at. I don't think so. This is uh, a rare vehicle, but uh, they aren't going to be rare much longer because this is what's coming out of the um, American services now, the big reel. It's got a multi-fuel engine. So you can run it on almost any combustible fuel, but mainly they run on the diesel, and they got a supercharged engine there too. And when they put their foot down, they've got the most attractive whistle. I love the sound of the big rail. Carrying a ferret around on its trailer, rather than go empty-handed. The old Bedford RL there, post-war British 4x4, went into service for many, many years. And there could well be some of the TA groups using them now, but they are coming onto the rally fields. Lovely, reliable, stout vehicle to own, but this is rare because it's got the uh, gantry fitted to the back of it. Going to show its pulling ability based on the S-type Bedfords that came out in the 50s, but these had four-wheel drive. Now it's going to pull the big uh, reel there, or try to. Let's see how he gets on. These lads come up to me in the commentary box said they wanted to have a play out in the ring and <laughs> they always put on a good demonstration. They get out there with their vehicles and not only they own them and enjoy them, they want to see what they're capable of and they, they put them to all sorts of tests and the crowds love it. They sit around there when it's dry and watch all the goings on and uh, we never know what's going to happen because it, it's never been planned. It's just uh, let's go out there and have a go. So here we got the um, RL Bedford Going to have a go at pulling a, a pretty heavy rail truck with its trailer and the uh, turretless ferret on the top. These ferrets, some had turrets, some didn't. Fair bit of weight, fair bit of drag on the soft ground, but the old Bedford stick it in four wheel drive and away it goes, no problem. And you'll probably get a little applause from the crowd. Not you as the driver, but the old lorry. Right, Bedfords of um, Bedfordshire, which is the commercial side of the Vauxhall Motors, produced a commercial vehicle right from about 1931. They are the first cousins of General Motors of America. And uh, when the war started, a lot of um, Bedford, three-tonners, etc., were called up into the army. And then they started producing their own army vehicle. They changed it by putting this broad front on there. And that was re really designed to house a huge air cleaner around about the um, 
carburetor because a lot of vehicles then were being used over in North Africa. This is the um, little Bedford that went on in a three-ton version but um, in its popularity but this one is rare because it's only the short wheelbase 30 underweight but they were a lovely lorry. The Bedford engine was second to none for uh, smooth running a big 28 horsepower overhead valve engine just the ordinary four-speed box no four-wheel drive just the typical military pattern tires and the military wheels here you see the flange on the side here for putting slings around for loading them on board ship etc you'll find that on each wheel of course um, no roll-on ferries in those days but this is a fine example of the 30 underweight Bedford and uh, a charming version of it too Well, now for something completely different. We've had some rare vehicles to look at. This is a military vehicle and extremely rare. It's the French Alouette, privately owned by Mike here. Mike, do tell us something about it. Well, this, as you rightly say, is, is uh, a military vehicle. It was produced in France in 1958 by the company Aerospatial, who've always made a very robust aircraft helicopter. And this is one called an Alouette II. It's a five-seater, two in the front, pilot over there, co-pilot here, and room for three people in the back. It has a three-bladed rotor and a, a big gearbox underneath and a jet engine, a gas turbine engine called an Artouste. The Artouste is an old technology engine, but it's fascinating. It fascinates me because it's a jet engine, but uh, just to give you some facts, when you start on this, it's incredibly noisy, this engine, incredibly noisy. For people outside, it's unbelievable. Uh, and again, it, things have improved that way in modern technology, but this one is noisy. When it's on what's called ground idle, once the engine is started and stabilized and it's burning fuel and starter cuts out, it's running at 17,000 revs per minute. And at 17,000 revs, it's developing just 20 shaft horsepower. And you let it warm at that speed until you're ready to fly, and you open the throttle and it comes up to 34,000 revs. And just that doubling in revs per minute brings the horsepower from 20 shaft horsepower to 465. Very robust, very sturdy gearbox, you can see there is the gearbox there. It's an oil-cooled gearbox and beautifully fastened in there, very, very strong. And it reduces those, that input shaft there at 34,000 revs. It comes down to about 420 revs there to rotate those blades. Now, I'm told the manufacturers proudly boast that if this gearbox runs out of oil, it'll run for an unbelievable 40 minutes before it would seize up. That's very sad. Now, if you haven't seen a red warning light that size in there in 40 minutes, you shouldn't be flying the helicopter. That's quite true. What about flying speed? Flying speed depends on the power input. In other words, it depends on the pitch of the blades. Great. Now, I can yeah. show you something about the pitch of the blades. This controls the pitch of the blades, and this is called the collective pitch lever, and it moves like that. And that's at full pitch. That's when you're on the floor. And if you look at the head here, you can see what happens when I raise that lever. Can you see the mechanism moving? And each blade is moved equally by the same amount of pitch. Doesn't seem much when you see it like that. But in actual fact, that makes all the difference from sitting on the ground to flying at it, maximum it more like speed. Turns like, it pitches put, them. Like, like it swimming pitches in a way, them. isn't it? Yes, like more, yes. Like it pitches them and away you go. So when you start up, it's like that, and as you get ready to fly, you just ease it up very, very gently. You feel the helicopter getting light on the skids. At that point, you have to be ready because a helicopter is one of those very unstable devices that, without the right input, will go off in any direction. It'll go forwards or sideways or backwards, and you have to be ready with your rudder pedals to make sure 
you counteract with your tail rotor, which is right down the end there. Little tiny rotor running at about 16, 1800 revs per minute. And that controls your direction um, this way like that. So what about its use with the uh, French Army, etc.? Is it a spotting plane? Or? This aircraft was used purely for VIP transport oh, it was. during its service life yeah. and has done very few hours doing just that role. Because with a cabin, so much perspective around, it's a wonderful for observation. Oh, superb. I've flown in a similar type thing, and, and the view you've got, Yes, it'd be ideal for us to go and do the, the yes. showground. But, uh, They're not used as much now. Uh, but they were the preferred machine when it came to rescue in the Alps and places like that. You could put stretchers on, uh, you could put stretchers on the front here, you can fit it with skis. I have some very, very wide skis to fit on here for icy conditions. You can fit a winch underneath with a big grab so that you can carry loads and it's just fitted underneath and you have a little trigger on your, on your joystick there to release when you get to a site. These are the joysticks here. So very, very versatile. Communications aircraft, it's really an aircraft that will do anything. Well, this is all about military vehicles and this is the sort of thing we don't see very often. You're a, not only a unique exhibit, you're, a new, you're part of a unique person yourself to, to want to own something like this because they aren't cheap to fly and we do appreciate yes. the fact that you do own it and can share it with so many others. It's been lovely talking to you, Mike, and thanks for all that very interesting information. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, this weekend at Barclay Castle, the MVT, that is the Military Vehicle Trust, have had a wonderful weekend, the best ever. I've never known a, a more varied selection of military vehicles anywhere at any time. It's been a wonderful, exciting weekend for me, and I hope the programme has been interesting for you.